Cool. Hello, everyone. My name is Quintus. I'm from the Flashbots research team. And today I'll be discussing intents. Um, and in particular, I'll be arguing that intents are sort of a, a social phenomenon that we've seen come up. And they, they don't represent technical advances, but re rather um, are emblematic of a shift in the way that the blockchain community has come to think about blockchains and, and the kind of problems we face. Um, and I'll try and make explicit why we've come to speak about intents and roughly what they are or, or um, how, what people take them to be. Um, and then I'll sort of complete, I think, what is the discussion around them? Because I, I often feel that there are parts of the discussion which are missing. Um, and really what I'll be arguing is that um, intents are part of a larger discussion which represents sort of a balance we have to strike. And intents represent one side of this, the other side is not that often discussed, and I'll get to that in a second, but it's important that we, we strike this balance. Um, but first, let's just discuss the one side of it, intents, right? And um, sort of more metaphorically put here, um, letting go, and it'll become clear why I, I call intents that in a second. But before I can make my case, um, it, it, it's easier for me to just establish a basic model of the blockchain. So the blockchain is a state machine. Um, you can think of Ethereum as a good example of this. It has an operator. Usually it has multiple validators, but for um, the sake of the examples today, thinking of a single operator is fine. And this operator requires permission permissions to transition the state machine. Uh, if we think of the state machine as a graph, or yeah, where states are nodes and edges are sort of valid transitions, then these permissions, which are messages from users, cryptographically signed messages, permit the operator to transition along certain edges. The other aspect of the model is that agents, here being users and the operator, have their utility depending on the state of the blockchain and of the world. Uh, an example of this is, um, I might care how much ETH I have in the next Ethereum block, but I also care how much that ETH is worth on Binance around the same time. What is an example of some of the permissions I was mentioning earlier? Transactions by far is the most uh, common example of this. Um, generally transactions are transition functions from one state of the blockchain to another. Um, and so if we come back to this sort of graph view of things, um, transactions are a permission for the operator to, to transition along a set of edges. Um, the, the different edges, depending on which, um, which uh, state is being fed as sort of input to the transaction. You can view it like that. Um, now, another thing that can be done with transactions is that, is that they can be combined. Generally, transactions aren't processed individually by the blockchain, but the um, processed in batches, but they're aggregated into batches. And, and the way they're applied basically is just through chaining. Right? So if we apply many transactions in sequence, effectively we have one large transaction. And so we can view it as sort of one large state transition. The key point of the slide here is that there are two activities which um, can be done with permissions, these, these messages. So they can be executed, which means transitioning the state machine, or they can be aggregated. In this, in this specific setting, we're talking about chaining them. Um, and this is where intents come into the picture. I think the sort of core concept around intents is that we are thinking about other forms of message aggregation. What do I mean by this? Well, in particular, I think we've realized that chaining doesn't need to be the only form of message aggregation. There are more interesting ways of aggregating messages, and we'll get to why they're more interesting in a second. So um, intense loosely, and again, it's a social concept, and so there's no rigorous definition, no strict definition, but I think this is relatively uncontroversial. Um, intents are messages which need not be executable in isolation. A transaction you can apply to Ethereum state, and you know exactly what state you're getting, but an intent you, can, you apply and it's not exactly clear um, what the next state will be, so you might have to combine this um, these messages with other messages and process these messages further into, say, for example, a transaction, and which can be applied to the to the state machine. Um, the implication of this uh, is that um, intents of messages which may require aggregation to be executed, and in general, we think of them as 
messages which do require aggregation, right? And, and here, aggregation, I mean combination of other messages um, into a transaction. So uh, I think if there's one takeaway from today's talk, it should be this picture. I think really what intents are about is about um, shifting our mental model to one in which instead of users just directly interacting with the operator of the blockchain, there's this intermediate layer of aggregation, right? This, this layer of intermediaries which users rely on to combine their messages, to aggregate their messages before they're applied to the blockchain. This has been the case for a while. There have been many um, sort of intermediaries, off-chain services uh, offered to users. We can think of RPC nodes um, as a very basic example. Um, but we've come to think of them a lot more now because I think we've come to realize that these intermediaries can address some of the issues which uh, users face. And let me justify that. So why do we care about intents? Why aggregation? Um, because aggregation solves a bunch of our problems. What are these problems? Well, if we look at the user's challenges today, abstractly, I would say that it's these kinds of things. So one is preference and citation and and mapping this to the message space. Users have very complex preferences, or they can have very complex preferences about what the next state of Ethereum um, they'd like to see, or sort of what the utility is for, for many different states. Um, and they have to sort of, con first they have to become aware of these preferences, and they have to map these to the messages which they have available to them. And in this case, it's uh, transactions, or generally it's transactions. Earlier I was saying that usually our utility depends on the state of the blockchain, but also the state of the world. Um, and generally, because users face latency um, delays, they have some uncertainty about what the state of the world will be when the next Ethereum block is produced. Mm -hmm. They also have strategic uncertainty, which is to say users don't know what other agents are doing. And because interaction be between user messages which are being applied to the blockchain, this impacts uh, the outcomes and therefore users are uncertain. A specific case of this is adversarial behavior. Right, other agents reacting to my information. A very clear example illustrating strategic uncertainty and adversarial behavior is slippage limits in, in AMM swaps. Um, users don't know if other users will be trading against the same asset pair in the, in the same block, and so they allow some tolerance for the price they end up getting um, in the form of a slippage limit. The downside to this is that you now open yourself up to sandwiching. Um, which would be adversarial behavior. Then you also have technical uncertainty, right? If you knew exactly what all the other users were doing and you knew what the price of finance will be in the future, uh, you might still have some uncertainty if the way that messages are processed uh, is stochastic. So for example, Ethereum today, there are like two to, two to the end different kinds of orderings in which end transactions can be ordered. And it's impossible to sort of check each of those and decide deterministically, and so generally there's some uncertainty as to in what order transactions will be applied. Another uh, challenge is costs. Yeah, many of these um, problems can be addressed somewhat by doing more computation on the blockchain. The problem is that this is expensive, um, as I guess we all know. And so my claim is that intents, intents address these. Um, and if we think back to the picture I was showing earlier, intents address these by leveraging an aggregation layer, a layer of intermediaries between the users and the blockchain. Uh, but let's go through each of these challenges and, and uh, see why that's the case. So um, if we remember that we're saying intents are uh, loosen the restrictions on the kinds of messages that users can send to the operator, um, we, now, we now see that, or yeah, I guess we see that um, users with complex preferences can now map these onto messages which more closely resemble their preferences. Um, if messages like transactions or mappings from one state of the blockchain to another, uh, this might not exactly reflect the user's preferences, which may depend on other kinds of information, um, right? So the, the, the input to the function isn't only the Ethereum state, um, but users also don't really reason in terms of Ethereum state. and, and um, abstracting the message space or, or allowing different kinds of messages moves away from this problem. The other problem is fundamental uncertainty. Uh, so just like I was saying, we could change the, the messages from being functions that map from um, state to state. We can change these to take into account some information about uh, the external world. And 
in this case, it would be the intermediaries that that provide this kinds of information to the, the user's messages, um, for example, about Binance price. Again, uh, another input that could be given to these messages is uh, information about what other users are doing. A really good example of this is like CowSwap or any kind of uniform clearing batch auction in which multiple user messages um, in some sense are conditioned on each other. Uh, and so the message executes based on information about um, other user messages, reducing strategic uncertainty. Technical uncertainty, an easy way of addressing this is by um, creating message formats uh, so that, you know, again, the batch auction is a really good example. Um, the price at which users are executed is only determined by um, the behavior of other agents, and there's no sort of stochastic uncertainty in, in the system um, built into the system. Costs, rollups are a really good example from the perspective of the L1, especially if the assets are in the L1, and I realize there's some nuance here. Um, rollups are um, basically ways of taking uh, a different kind of message format, right? The, the rollup transactions, processing these, and then um, executing them on the, or I should say, aggregating these and executing them on the L1 um, in a much more cost efficient way. So that's the one side of, of the balance. Um, what's the other side? Um, and the other side, I think, is generally MEV, um, but it's regaining control. If intents were about sort of giving freedoms, reducing frictions for intermediaries that aggregate messages from users, um, the MEV side, the other side of the discussion, should be about controlling these um, these entities so that they don't sort of run amok. Um, so, what are the problems? What are these abuses of freedom that, that can happen? Um, right. So one thing we want, uh, one thing we want from these intermediaries is we want integrity, right? So if they uh, promise they'll do a, a certain kind of computation, um, then we want to know that uh, at least if there's some output produced by the intermediary, they have some valid input to this output. Um, a good example is that uh, if a block builder is is constructing blocks, then um, the blocks that they're constructing um, haven't unbundled users' input. So usually users' input um, bundles to, to blocks, uh, and these bundles will be sequences of transactions. And the user will express a, a rule saying, hey, these uh, transactions must be executed in this specific sequence. Um, but of course, right now um, on Ethereum, there's no way of enforcing that the blocks um, which are executed actually obey these rules um, from the users. So in some sense, the integrity of the computation has been um, violated. A good example of this is the low carb crusader attacks, which happened a couple of months ago. Uh, another example is like avoiding an incorrect straight state transition function. The output of a rollup computation is a new state for the rollup, um, and this must come from the, the uh, correct application of of, um, or at least you should have the rollup transactions that lead to the output state of the rollup. Another property we want from these intermediaries is the provision of information, right? Um, and here I mean provision of information to to the to the messages to to the computation, right? So really, what we mean is correct input. Um, and so if we think about uh, the cow swap example I was giving earlier, um, we want not only that the um, the, the batch uh, the batch is, that is executed clears the um, orders which were presented as the input, but we want the input to represent all orders which were uh, contenders to be executed. Or in the in the case of a rollup, we don't want the rollup operator to censor user transactions. Uh, another example is um, we want the intermediaries to provide up to date. Uh, price information when they execute user orders, if they're supposed to be executing this this, these orders based on um, based on external world prices. Then uh, if we can guarantee that we have the correct input and we guarantee that the output which is um, presented actually maps to this input, the other thing we care about is privacy, which is to say that um, the 
the use of the information uh, of the input to the computation and the output of the computation is restricted to its intended use, right? So if I, for example, send my orders to a uh, batch auction executor, I um, both want them to execute the batch, batch auction correctly, to not censor any of, any of my counterparties and to clear me at a uniform price, um, but also to not front run um, the batch, perhaps a sort of um, moving prices uh, against or sort of giving me worse execution. And so that was the other side of, of the balance. Um, but what, what can we say about these two sort of components about intent and MEV together? How do they combine? What are the, what are the challenges of finding this balance? One challenge is that um, latency overhead reintroduces uncertainty. Remember, remember I was saying that um, one of the benefits of intents is that they can reduce uncertainty for users. Um, if the way we restrain intermediaries, the way we restrain the aggregation layer is through um, mechanisms which introduce latency, we are undoing some of these goods. And so what are examples of this? Um, proof computation time. If we re require ZK proofs of these kinds of things to um, guarantee the, the correctness of computation, this introduces latency. Another example is DA consensus. So if we are running some, um, some blockchain to some consensus protocol to uh, prevent any individual party from censoring input to, for example, to, for example a batch auction, um, this also introduces latency. DE overhead is another example. Another problem is that too much privacy kills counterparty discovery, right? So for example, you can't have a fully private order flow auction, um, or maybe you can, but it's likely not that, that efficient. Usually a counterparty needs to know some information in order to match an order, or, you know, I guess it depends on the market you're running. Um, another example is that uh, the intermediaries face denial of service risk. And this is, I guess, a little bit different from the other two issues. Um, which is to say intermediaries can't accept arbitrary messages because uh, denial of service resistance generally relies on the intermediary being able to very cheaply verify that um, some computation they're doing is going to be um, valuable. Um, and so this restricts the kinds of messages which users can send to, to intermediaries. Um, Yes, I won't say too much more about that. And so that's the end of my talk. Um, I hope that made sense. I was sort of brief um, for the sake of time. And so there's a couple of things I, I didn't cover. I just wanted to be explicit about those. Um, one thing is I didn't really give too many examples of intermediaries we see today, or I, I guess I mentioned you know, batch auctions, roll-ups. These are examples. Um, I didn't explain why reliance on trust and in intermediaries is bad. Um, I guess to some degree, this is somewhat obvious, especially to a block blockchain crowd, but I think there's a bit more of an argument to be made here. Um, and then finally, uh, I didn't really explain how Flashbot is th Flashbots is thinking about these issues, um, but it's you know, this kind of discussion and the challenges which I listed before are certainly things we're, we're thinking about. Um, and so I hope I've sort of shed some light on the intense discussion, or at least given my opinion, um, and I, I really hope that people sort of keep in mind the, the concerns and the risks that come with introducing this, this uh, layer of intermediaries, even if it um, does present better quality execution for users. Thanks.